Parish Creek, how we doing? Let's go, let's go, let's go. All right, new series, and we're going to start with a game, a game show. Uh, let's play Family Feud. You guys familiar with it? Yeah. Anybody watch play Family Feud? If you don't have any context, you're about to learn. Uh, just call me Steve Harvey. But uh, we're going to do, so I surveyed on Instagram. I sent out a survey. A few thousand people chimed in. Uh, what do Christians do? is the question. What do Christians do? If you're not familiar with Family Feud, uh, you're trying to answer according to what the people said. It'll be this section right here versus this section right here. Anybody else is, is welcome to help them, but we'll just kind of, you know, there'll be winners, there'll be losers, all the things. And so we'll start with you guys. What do Christians do? Go to church. I heard go to church. Show me. Go to church. It's on the board. I'm going to go. I'm going to tell you up front. Abide's not up there, so don't even guess that. It's the series title. All right, here we go. Pray. Number one answer by a landslide. Like the biggest thing they said was pray over and over. All right, give me another one. Read the Bible. Show me read the Bible. Let's go. It's up there. Christians do indeed read the Bible. Serve. I heard serve. Serve, love, love God, love people, all the things. You don't even have to raise your hand. We're just, just like, we're just, just wheels off. Forgive, I heard forgive. Forgive is up there. We're doing it. Share the gospel. They're going to sweep this place. Because you probably watched we, you know, the first service. Okay, I heard worship, worship. Show me worship. That's what the people said. All right, what else? Give, show me give. Give generously is up there. Make disciples, show me make disciples. And they swept it. They swept it. You never even got a shot. I'm so sorry. That's not how the first service went. But you guys, you guys are good. You know what Christians do. Let me ask you a question Can you do all of those things and not be a Christian? You absolutely can do all of those things and not be a Christian, which is ironic. Something to give thought to, that there are people who are Christians, or, or at least they embrace the title Christians, they go to church, they, they, and they do all of those things, but they're not saved. And then you have people who are Christians, or call themselves Christians, and they don't do any of those things. And so there's this weird contrast. So like what is the difference? And what I want to make it a case for you in the coming weeks as we kick off this series is it is indeed the word abide. That's the missing puzzle piece. Like that's the thing that has to go in there. You cannot abide and not be a Christian. Like this is the game changer. This is the, the word that you put it in place, it changes all of the other outputs. It, it changes all of the, like if I abide, the way I pray is different. If I abide, the way I read the Bible is different. If I abide, the way I make disciples is different. Listen, I can, I, I went to church most of my life and I would share the gospel with you without having even trusted in the gospel myself. That's why I'm so passionate about it because when I became a follower of Jesus, I felt like I was duped. And I'm like, man, I don't, I, I was in church my whole life. I was doing all the church things. I owned multiple Bibles. But I wasn't abiding with Jesus. In fact, when I heard relationship with Jesus, I thought that's just this thing that we all say, but like who can really have a relationship with someone that you can't see? And so I just continued saying that, like I had one, you have one, we have one, but I didn't have one. And so we're starting a new series titled Abide. This is born out of, if you remember the I Am series, uh, we covered, Jesus says, I am the vine in John 15. That is the chapter where you see this word repeated, uh, abide. And as I taught that, I thought, you know what? I think God has more for us here. This is a deeper well than we're able to cover it in, in one short week. And so we're going to dive back into that chapter. You can turn to John 15, and that's where we're going to be today, verses 1 through 8. And I would just say, 
I read an article this week that the, the title was uh, The Prove It Generation. And it said that Gen Z is the prove it generation, okay? And it went on to say how they can buy dupes on Amazon. You can get fake sneakers, fake watches, fake Versace, fake Louis Vuitton, fake brands. Uh, they are the generation where this, this monster of AI was born that stands for artificial intelligence. And so they're looking at fake images, pictures of people that, that, were, that ne were never taken, like they were just made by robots, it's crazy. Um, deep fake, it's like, hey, you can watch a video of somebody doing something that that person never did. Fake news, fake articles, fake ideas, uh, you know, people, the media, other things, propagating ideas because they get clicks and likes, but they're, they're stories that are told that are untrue. And so these, these guys, like I'll tell you an interesting aside, when someone asks me about flat earth, I answer questions on Fridays, and I just get an overwhelming number of questions about flat earth, okay? Like, do you believe the earth is flat? And I'm like, I thought I was being trolled. But it turns out there are a group of reasonable people who passionately believe the earth is flat and a whole nother group that, that believe we never landed on the moon. And, and in fact, they would just say, I don't trust that source. I'm out, like whatever that, like that, I don't trust the source. So I don't trust the, the, you know, the information that I'm getting from the source. They are the prove it generation. And when it comes to Christianity, it's like, I'm a Christian. Their, their mindset is, prove it. And this is why I believe this is so important for us here. I want a distinctive of this church, moving into 2024 and, and forward. I want a distinctive of this church to be that we train and equip you to be and make disciples, especially in the home that you would understand, that we give you all the handholds, the, the resources, the, the programs, and the processes that you can leave this place and you know you are well equipped, we are world class at teaching you how to make disciples in the home. Because what I think we are good at here in the Bible Belt, in Texas, in churches in Texas, is, is teaching our children how to be really good, upstanding citizens, contributors to society who go to church. And that is very different than the call of a disciple. It's so important that we understand this. I think for so many of us, and, and in fact, sometimes the people that are elevated are like, oh, they're a good Christian. And what they're really trying to say is they're a person who makes good choices and goes to church. And that Jesus didn't, Jesus didn't say, hey, do good and go to church. He said, come and die. Like die to the things that the world is calling you to. And so the enemy of having this is thinking you have it when you're this. And I'm telling you, as I've said many times, the chasm between a churchgoer and a Christ follower is really large. Those are two very different things. And that scripture where Jesus says, depart from me, I never know you, knew you, is like, what? And I don't know if you've ever studied it, but the follow-up on that is, but I led a ministry. <laughs> but, but I did ministry in your name. Like I told people about Jesus. And he's like, I know, but I didn't know you. So there's people that are like, I know him, and they don't tell people about Jesus. And then there's people who tell people about Jesus, and he's saying, they don't really know me. And you can't just turn the page and go on with your life as though that's no big deal. We gotta say, what do we do with that? What does it mean? And, I, and I'm telling you, I think the solution or the answer to the question is abide and hear 
is the challenge that I'm up against up front. The application of this message is really like a a, a mental ascent, an intellectual ascent, if you will. It's not to leave here and go do something because we've already established you can do all the things with a wrong heart or a wrong understanding, a wrong why, a wrong motive. So there's something that we have to learn that really is the application which can feel like, wait, hold on, but what, what do I do? And it's like, no, you learn. Abiding really is about being, not doing. That before we do anything, we've gotta get the, the being right. A right understanding uh, of who Christ is. That's what's going to produce the fruit. And I'll just say up front two things. You're going to hear things that are going to challenge your thinking and maybe even contradict some of the things that you've heard before in, in your journey of faith. And that's okay, you can ask questions. I, I'm never afraid of questions. I, I welcome the conversations afterwards, always. Somebody's like, wait, what did you mean by this? Or hey, I didn't quite understand this, or I didn't miss this point. Those are great questions because they tell me that people come here with the heart to learn, so that's a good thing. I also wanna say to you, it's a series. So today will not be a comprehensive lesson on abiding, it's just the introduction. And in fact, I would call this the fruit of abiding with the help of the Trinity, because we're going to see the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit at work to produce fruit in those of us who abide. That's really this idea, the concept that Jesus is, is giving us here, and I just, I wanna set you up, like, hey, you may leave with some questions. Wrestle them, come back, let's keep the conversation going, and hopefully at the end of the series, you're like, all right, I got it, I understand what it means to abide. Uh, today we're going to look at the work of the Father, the work of the Son, and the work of the Holy Spirit in producing the fruit of abiding. That's the outline of the message. Uh, this is very simple in theory, but takes a lifetime to perfect. And so it's easy to read the words on the page, but it really is something that you will do for the rest of your life as you're trying to understand what does this mean to press deeper in to Jesus. Let's dive in. I'll just read the whole scripture. I'll be in verses one through eight. These are the words of Jesus. Jesus chose his words. Holy Spirit preserved the words in the scripture for thousands of years that we would read them today and effort to apply them to our lives to understand why. What does he want us to do with this? So this is what Jesus said. I am the true vine. He says the true vine because Israel was also called the vine, but Israel, it says that he, they did not produce fruit. So Jesus shows up on the scene and says, I am the true vine and I produce the fruit for the branches that remain in me. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. That word remain in me, it's the Greek word meno. It's the word that we, in some versions of the Bible, translate abide or interpret abide. Um, abide, remain in me, same word, same meaning. Uh, this word is also shows up in the scripture to mean um, continue in, endure through, remain. Uh, NIV here has it as remain, yours might have abide. Dwell is another translation. Verse five, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That's worth underlining. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. In this illustration, and I want you to know, as someone who uses illustrations every week, has to come up with them every week, there are no perfect illustrations. And so there are something that the illustrations illustrate or teach, and then you can over-index on the illustrations to, to kind of go outside. But wait, you said 
well, hold on, thrown into the fire, what is that, you know? And so we need to stay in the fairway of the illustration to say, all right, what is he trying to tell us with this illustration, right? And he presents to us different parts. The father, who is the gardener, the son, who is the vine, and there's, there's the branches. Who are the branches? Who are the branches? Us. We are the branches. And then fruit is produced on the branches if they remain on the vine. But the first interpretive challenge that we're faced with is this reality that the Father prunes the branches. What does that mean? And so that's my first point, is the Father prunes fruitful branches. Before we get into the pruning, we have to deal with the real interpretive challenge is that some of the branches are removed altogether. And so which branches are removed? There's two verses that address this, two, verses two and verse six. Two says, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. So a branch that doesn't bear fruit is cut off, not pruned, but cut off altogether. And then, and then he says in verse 6, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into fire and burned. And so what does he cut off? It's two things. And you can write this in the margin of your Bible because there's, when you study this, you see, oh, there's really two branches that are removed. The first one is the one that bears no fruit. They appear to be in Christ or in church or fellowshipping, but there's no fruit that comes from their lives. They're, they're not sharing the gospel. They're not making disciples. They're not studying the word. They're not praying, right? They're not, they're, there's no fruit coming from them. And the other one is branches that don't remain in Christ. Um, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers if you do not remain in me. Um, this one is tricky because it may produce fruit by their own effort. Like maybe they do read the Bible. Maybe they do share the gospel. Maybe they do go to church. Maybe they do pray. But, they, but they're not, they're doing so as, for the purpose of showing up to life group and having something to say. Not out of their remaining in Jesus. Now here's a question I want to present to you that I think is worth asking. Do they know they're pretending? And I believe the answer to that question, without a doubt, is no. They are not aware. That's why you have this argument with Jesus. <laughs> He's like, they're like, wait, hold on, but I did this in your name. And He's like, depart from me, I never knew you. So I grew up thinking that, that there were people that they would come to church, and they just did it because they thought it was good for business, but they kind of, you know, they, they get in the car on the way home and they're like what a load of garbage you know or or there's pastors that kind of preach and and they're like yeah if you just give me money then I will and they get in the back of their office and they're counting their money like <laughs> I got them right where I want them you know I'm running this shell game I don't think that is reality um, I think if it is it, it's I believe it's the extreme exception that in most of the cases, these people, they're doing all the things, thinking, believing, having convinced themselves, I know Jesus, but they don't. And, you, and it's okay to wrestle, wait, why would anyone think they know Jesus, but not actually know Jesus? We'll talk about it. Verse three, if you're questioning your own salvation right about now. Verse three is a comfortable blanket. It's, like, it's a parenthetical statement that Jesus says almost in, in anticipation of us, but wait, wait, Jesus, hold on. He says, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you, which is the gospel. Have you believed upon the gospel? 
Now, don't get too comfortable because I think you have to answer, do I really literally believe this guy showed up, lived a perfect life, died, went in the tomb, and three days later showed back up, and, and he died as a payment for my sins? Do I believe that is history? Not legend, not a story we're told, not something we celebrate like Santa Claus, but, but something rooted in history that it actually happened, and my whole eternity hinges on that reality. And then he says, and some branches are pruned. And what are the qualifications of the branches that are pruned? What kind of branches are pruned? Is it the bad ones? Is it the ones that don't do what they need to be doing? The ones that sin? The one, what branches are pruned? The fruitful branches. The only qualifications that are necessary to be pruned is that you were fruitful that you did everything you need to do, and that's something we gotta wrestle with. That when we do all that we're supposed to do, what is promised to us is pruning. And the pruning doesn't mean that we did something wrong, that it actually means we did something very right. What's the purpose of the pruning? That they would bear more fruit. That more fruit. Now, this is a literal thing. Everybody there understands vine. Everybody, you know, Jesus' original audience, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, the vines. We see vines everywhere. Like Nate showed us last week, the grapes, you know, this, this area is bursting forth with vines and pruning. And in fact, I talked to um, uh, a, a vineyard expert this week, and they were talking about how the timing of the pruning is even more important than the harvest because it determines, like, that, that really is the more, or, or when you prune at the right time, it brings forth more grapes, it brings forth more fr fruit, and so it's rooted in there, and Jesus is using this, and he's saying, hey, this, like, God's timing is perfect, he knows what he's doing, and the purpose in everything that he does is to produce more fruit. What is pruning? Pruning can be circumstantial, hardship, uh, it, it can be... Uh, you know, a situation you're going through, it can be a layoff, it can be loss, it can be grief, it can be a diagnosis. It's something that happened to you that you didn't do anything to bring onto your life. That's easy because of the way this is written, and this is where I think we can over-index on the illustration. It's easy to, to think about, read this, and think, okay, God is sitting there, and he's He's actively taking something away from me that causes me much pain. How am I not to turn my back on, on you know, a maniacal God that would do that? You have to keep in mind that it is God's first desire that there would be no loss or grief here, that there would be no suffering here. His first desire is that that wouldn't, that wouldn't be, and yet he created us with an ability to pursue a relationship with him or to pursue ourselves and the world. And as we pursued ourselves and the world, sin rushed in like a tsunami. Brokenness, hurt, and pain rushed in like a, a tsunami. So the pruning, I think, is when you go through those things, what you do with it determines the pruning that's happening in your life. For example, when someone is pruned, one of two things happen. They fall in or they fall out. Okay, they're going through a pruning and they say, God, I really need you in this time. Here's what's going on. I'm moving closer to you. Can you help? How can you use this? What do you want to do with this? What are you trying to teach me in this? Or they say, God, if you're going to allow this to happen to me, then I don't want anything to do with you and I'm out. They fall in or they fall out. And if they fall in, what typically happens is a more fruitful ministry. I can think in my own life, just to give you some practical examples of this, uh, or historical examples of this, in my own life, there was a season where I went through like intense anxiety and panic attack, and it was a humbling season that softened me, and it grew in my heart empathy. It grew, it gave me uh, more tools to pastor people, to sit in situations. And now that, you know, there's an entire part of my ministry is to meet with people and counsel people going through anxiety and panic. And in that time, I, I, I learned 
therapy practices that overlapped with what the scripture teaches and my faith grew and it was a pruning that has produced a greater harvest. You can imagine how insufferable I'd be had I not learned empathy and, and care in that time, right? It's just hard charging, suck it up, let's go. And God humbled me. This week on the pod, on, on Becoming Something podcast, we interviewed uh, Granger Smith. Granger and his wife Amber uh, their, their three-year-old river um, fell into a pool when he couldn't swim and drowned. And it's, it's a horrific story. And he, he told it on the podcast. And, and he, he talked about all that God taught them in and through this. And then he had the, the wherewithal and the wisdom to, to pause and say, wait a minute, I need to say something to you. I am speaking about this today very different than I did in the event. You know, like, like hindsight, I can see the goodness of God in the event. It was just sad and hard and terrible and awful. And, and he said, in fact, some well-meaning relative texted them, you know, some plight cliche, hey, you know, God is good. And, and it was, it didn't land well because there's a time for mourning. And that was only a time for mourning. But now they're able to take this story, this pruning, and, and use it, and not only are they telling, you know, doing podcasts like ours, but it's turned into a book, and the story has ministered to tens and thousands of people who are going through grief themselves. What is that? It's a fruitful harvest. They're taking this thing that happened to them, they bring it to the Father, and they say, how do you want to use this? I'm clinging to you in the midst of this. And he says, okay, let's go. We'll use it. It's been a hard week. It's been, a, it's been a challenging week. I had some friends, you know, their son fell off the back of an ATV. Dead. About the same age as our son. And then my, some of my best friends gave birth to a sweet baby girl who lived for just under two hours. And you think, why would God intend for babies to be born and live for two hours. And I would tell you, he didn't. He purposed that little girl to live forever. And we lose sight of eternity so fast, so fast, that God created us to live forever with him. And so as we live in this broken world where there's all kinds of broken people who do very, very broken things, we have to ask constantly, Lord, what do you want to do with this? What ministry do you have for me in the midst of my suffering? And here's what I want you to know. He's not in a hurry for you to get there. He's a slow and patient God. And the only reason that he would be rushing to get to that part is just because he's eager to flood your heart with the peace that he has for you when you bring him the broken branches and pruning. I think I see all the time, you know, just in pastoral ministry, someone's like, no one, I hear this all the time, no one understands. No one understands. No one understands my miscarriage. No one understands my stillborn. No one understands my cancer. No one understands my eating disorder. No one understands my abortion. No one understands my same-sex attraction. No one understands. No one understands. And I'm always like, as a pastor, I'm like, they understand, and they understand, and they understand, because I just talked to them and heard them say the same thing. No one understands. No one understands, and the church has been awful, miserable at creating avenues of discussion so that people can show up and say, now, I was abused like that. I went through the same kind of trauma they did. You know what? That same thing happened to me, and then they talk, and they get dead. Oh, my goodness, and how did you? And it's like, well, here's what was helpful to me. Well, here's what was helpful to me, and it's like, okay. 
Let's lock arms and begin to walk forward into freedom. And the devil hates it. He'll show up, but you can't tell anybody. And there's areas of our church where he's winning. And I, you know, what I have is the benefit of seeing the people who say for the first time things out loud that they never would say again. And they say it the second time with a little bit more confidence. And then the third time with just a little bit chest out, chin up. And then the fourth time they're leading a small group discussion. And the fifth time they're speaking on a stage with a microphone. And the sixth time they're yelling, freedom! It's available to us. Pruning. Verse 4, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And so Jesus is the vine, we are the branches, and fruit is produced by remaining connected to him. My second point is the son produces fruit. The son, Jesus Christ, produces fruit. This is so important. This is, this is abiding. This, this is this ethereal, you know, intellectual concept that we are to remain in Christ. Let me tell you how this series came to be, okay? Uh, I'm, I'm up here. I'm on stage, and I read a verse, Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And then the next verse that I read up here on stage talking to you was 1 Thessalonians 5. And it says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And I have this kind of like, you know, I'm talking to you, but I'm thinking up here. And I'm like, wait a minute, those two verses, they end the same way, in Christ Jesus. And so I leave here and I do this phrase study. Where else does it say in Christ Jesus? How, how often is this repeated throughout the scriptures, in Christ Jesus? And so I just, I'll show you, watch this, look. Well, you could just come over here. And so in Acts 24, faith in Christ Jesus. Romans 6, God and life in Christ Jesus. Are in Christ Jesus. Who are in Christ Jesus. Glory in Christ Jesus. Co-workers in Christ Jesus. Uh, 1 Corinthians, you in Christ Jesus. First Corinthians, you are in Christ Jesus. You in Christ Jesus. You in Christ Jesus. Galatians in Christ Jesus. You are in Christ Jesus. One in Christ Jesus. Uh, Ephesians, faithful in Christ Jesus. They are in Christ Jesus. Us in Christ Jesus. Uh, accomplished in Christ Jesus, church in Christ Jesus, people in Christ Jesus, called me in Christ Jesus, minds in Christ Jesus, glory in Christ Jesus, Colossians, faith in Christ Jesus, which is in Christ Jesus, Thessalonians in Christ Jesus, you in Christ Jesus, we in Christ Jesus, 2 Timothy, that is in Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy, I skipped that, that is in Christ Jesus, everyone in Christ Jesus, uh, Philemon, in Christ Jesus, it's overwhelming. It's like the Holy Spirit is trying to say something to you. You can't do this thing if you're not in Christ Jesus. We better understand what it means to be in Christ Jesus. It is foundational to living as a follower of the one that we are to remain in. We can do all those things. Show me again the list, the, the other one, the family feud. We can pray and read the Bible and make disciples and give generously to forgive and love and serve and go to church and share the God and do all of those things not connected. And look, we're this. It looks just like the other branches. It looks just like the other branches, but no lime is going to grow on this. No line. But it looks just like those. But nothing's going to grow on it. Because it's not connected. So apart from the sun, no lasting fruit is produced. So what does it mean to abide? In my best effort to explain this, this is the important part, the meat, okay? I was in a conversation with John Mark Comer, which on your 3E, evidently, Ruthless Elimination of Hurry is the number one recommended book by Harris Creek. It's a John Mark Comer's book, if you're not aware. And in a conversation with him, I said, John, what do you think it means to abide? And I love what he said. He said, it's like being in two places at once. And I said, well, what do you mean being in two places at once? 
And he's like, like when you're a new mom, you hardly have time to do a Bible study or a quiet time. And there really is not a lot of quiet time when you're a new mom, you know? And, um, and he said, but what you can be doing is you can be changing diapers. And as you're changing diapers, it's as though Jesus is in the room with you. And you can be reflecting on things that he said and letting his word wash over you and purify you from within or, or praying over a child as you change those diapers. And so you're doing it as though Jesus is present. And as you work, right, you can go to work without Jesus, which is very different than one who remains in him and goes to work, sits in a cubicle or in an office or at a desk or whatever it is that you do behind a counter, and Jesus is with you. And, and you have this mindset constantly that Jesus is with you. That changes the way you're going to surf the internet. It changes the hashtags you're going to click on on Instagram or where you're going to navigate to on TikTok when you believe Jesus is with you. It changes everything you do if you think, okay, Jesus is with me and I'm in constant communication with him. I'm talking with him and he's present with me. And, and for some of us, that's like a new idea when I'm telling you, according to the words of Jesus, it's foundational to everything that we believe about him and what we do flowing out of our relationship with him. And you know, you meet someone like John Mark or Dallas Willard or Eugene Peterson and, and, or, or just that person, if you don't know who they are, that person that just, re like they just get it. They're all the time following Jesus, all the time. They're just something. And you're like, what's different about you? It's abiding. It's not for the professional Christians. It's not for people who've been called to vocational ministry. It's not for the you know, college student that, that well, they're, they're the weird, or they're in the Christian sorority or Christian fraternity. No, 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 it is for everyone. It's baseline, it's foundational. I'll give one more to try to hit home what this means. In sitcoms, there's this plot that's kind of been played out over and over. And in the plot, someone saves someone's life. And then what they do is they spend the rest of the episode trying to repay them. And I think Family Matters, I think Urkel, is that anybody? I think that happened there. Uh, saved by, if you're a kid of the 90s like me, uh, Saved by the Bell, I think, I think it was Jesse or Screech was like pushed out of the, the lockers were falling. Maybe it was an earthquake, it's a little fuzzy. Uh, but somebody saved somebody's life. And the rest of the episode, they're trying to repay them. They're like, you saved my life. You, sa you guys tracking with that? Anybody know what, you know what I'm talking about? You seen something like that in TV? Okay. You saved my life. And they get real clingy. They're like, no, I can't. Like, but what can I hear? I just want to. I just, there, there's like gratitude overwhelming in them. It's overflowing in them. They're like, we, I don't know what to do with all this gratitude that I feel. That's abiding. I don't think we, Harris Creek, the church in America, the vast majority of us, dare I say, like live with an understanding that Jesus Christ has done exponentially more for you than any human being ever has or ever will. And so any gratitude you would feel, it's like, what do I have in Christ Jesus? Is it, is it like a, a new car or a new phone or a billion dollars? It's so much more than anything you can imagine. To where, here, here's what I'm going to have the audacity to say. It's like, how can I worship a God who allowed pruning? If the good that he offers you in light of the pruning is so good that you would say it was worth it. And only God can do that. And you might be like, it's not worth it. It's not worth I don't. No, no, slow down, slow down. What would make it worth it? And answer the question. You, you took away, well, if he'd give them back to you forever, would that make it worth it? What would make it worth it? And if you answer that question, right? Because 
But the other side is just take away. It's just loss. It's just grief. But God can give you a good that's so good that you would say it was worth it. And I'm not just talking hypothetical up here. You answer the question. I'm going to skip verse 7. I'm going to come back to it in coming weeks. It's intentional. Verse 8, this is to my Father's glory. Got 11 seconds. (laughs) All right. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. To my Father's glory that you bear my fruit. The showing yourselves, the, the word proves. My third point is the fruit of the Spirit proves a disciple. The fruit of the Spirit is, is evident of the disciple. If this feels redundant, it's because the chapter's so redundant. It's like, you remain in me, and I remain in you, and you will bear fruit, but you won't bear fruit unless you remain in me, and I remain in you, and you got to remain in me in order to do this, and remain in me, remain in me. It's, it's cyclical. It's as though God is saying there in your Bible, hey, this right here, it's super important. We got to get this. You you have to figure this part out. In Matthew 7, he says it like this. These are also the words of Jesus. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Uh, Do people pick up grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, their fruit you thus by their fruit you will recognize them and so the fruit let's see it again what's the fruit that we talked about up front the 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 family fruit the fruit you pray you read the bible you make disciples you give children like this is the fruit the world is seeing it's not just that but this this mindset of all right i'm going to die with jesus and i'm going to make disciples there's more going to be birthed forth but not just that then the character qualities the fruit of the spirit God's spirit, Jesus' spirit living inside of you produces Galatians 5, love, joy, peace, forbearance, or patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, that these things are birthing. Now, if I say, come up here and, and grow fruit, like, hey, you ever come here and grow, grow, like sprout an apple, you're not going to be able to. You're going to be like, I'm not a tree. I'm like, okay, great. Here's a tree. Make it grow. Make it grow a lot. Make it, look, have, have this grow here. Go, go. Like, I, I can't. All I can do is put it in the environment. Put it in a situation where fruit is able to grow. Right? And if I live in that environment, then fruit is going to grow. If I stay in that in, environment, it's the same with us, yielding to the Holy Spirit. To say it plainly, a disciple is not someone who simply produces fruit. A disciple is someone who abides in Jesus and fruit is produced. The difference between those two things is so important. It's so important. And and we get this, conceptually you get this. Like I can do something and it doesn't make, like I can put out a fire, right? It doesn't make me a fireman, right? I can diagnose something. Uh, you know, I can, I can look at you and say, this is medically what I think is wrong with you, and, and man, you should take to Advil. I would be out of my mind to then say, I'm a doctor. I did what doctors do, I'm a doctor. No, it's not what makes you a doctor. I, I, can, I, can, I can translate the law for you. And I say, this is the law, and this is what needs to happen, and these are consequences to the law. I'm an attorney. You know, I can say, hey, the speed limit is 60 miles an hour. If you go over the speed limit, this is what's going to happen. This is what it looks like. These are the consequences. And I walk away, and I say, look, I'm a lawyer. And you'll be like, you're not a lawyer. I'm like, yeah, I am a lawyer. I just did what lawyers do. Goes, That's not what makes you a lawyer. There's something that has to be in place prior to you doing that. And that's abiding for followers of Jesus. You have to have the abiding peace right or else you're just doing stuff. In summary, the father prunes fruitful branches. The son produces fruit. And the fruit of the spirit proves the disciple. 
Um, what's, what's the difference between this line and this line? It's attached. It's true. That's attached. This one's not pretty. This one's pretty. About as pretty as it comes. It's fake. It's fake. It's not real. Can you guys verify? It's not real. Not real. It's, I mean, it's, it really, it is prettier than these. I mean, these kind of like got some yellow, brown spots. This one's almost perfect. Looks the part. It's, it, it's not going to have any taste. But here's the deal. When it dies, it will not produce a harvest. <laughs> okay? Why? Because it was never alive because it was never alive. It just tried to make itself look like that. And this is why this is so important to me. Because fake fruit replicates real fruit, but it duplicates fake fruit, okay? It replicates real fruit, but it duplicates fake fruit. It makes more fake fruit. You can tell your children, listen, we believe there's this place called heaven, this place called hell. And we believe that hell is an awful place where there's no goodness of God there. And that if people don't trust in Jesus, they're going to be there forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And we really believe that. And you go out and you come up against people every day who are going to hell and you don't tell them how to get to heaven. Your kids are going to be like, oh, this is this thing that we pretend like we believe, but we don't really believe because our actions don't follow through with what we say we really believe. We can say, hey, this world, it's not like it's all gonna fade away. And what really matters is the treasures we store in eternity. And then we try to store up all of our treasures here on earth and be like, oh, okay, I get it, I get the game. So we say this one thing, but, and we say we believe it, and we say it passionately, but we live as though we don't, and you'll make fake fruit. And the fake fruit will sit in church and get in small groups with fake fruit. Do you see how, how this, much this matters? That's how you get to uh, depart from me, I never knew you. You're like, yeah, but hold on. I was, I was doing all kinds of stuff in your name. And that's why, like, man, I'm like, what are we doing? What are we doing? And you say, you say hey, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna teach someone to read the Bible. And what do we do when they're like, hey, I'm reading the Bible and it doesn't make sense. We go, okay, well, let me go like interpretation, observation, application, like here's some methodology. Like, hold on, that other thing has to be there first. Like you gotta have the abiding thing first or else you're gonna read the Bible. You might as well be reading the Wall Street Journal. You're gonna read it so you show up to life groups saying that you read it. That's different than reading a love letter from, from a spouse who's at war who you haven't talked to in six months. You're going to hang on to every word. You see, you see the difference? It's different. And so if you're here, you're like, man, you know, it's interesting because I've been reading the Bible. I don't really enjoy it. It doesn't really make sense to me. But I'm, like, I'm not going to come at you with tips, tricks, and techniques. I'm going to say, hold on. You, you sure you got the abiding thing? You sure that's there? You sure you understand who Jesus is, what he's done for you? You're living with gratitude for that? You sure? Because the enemy of, of understanding that is thinking you understand that. And just going through life pretending like you understand it and assuming everyone else is doing the same pretending. I'm just, I'm just crazy enough to say there's some people here that literally believe this man lived a perfect life, died and showed back up. And he's got an inheritance reserved for us forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. We're going to be with him forever and ever and ever and ever. It's crazy. It's crazy. But it's true. I'm going to pray we'd believe it. Help us believe it, God. We can't even believe it on our own. 
we need your help. I'm just gonna give you some space. You, you talk to him. You need to, you need to talk to him. Just say, hey, this is where I've missed it. This is where I haven't been abiding. This, this is the time though. <laughs> like, like right now you can practice it. God, I'm gonna abide right now in this room full of people for the first time. I'm gonna talk to you as though you're real.